Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. The Acts of the Apostles, often called the, simply the book of Acts, uh, begins with a curious statement. Luke, who wrote the gospel by that name, uh, also writes this book, and he says that in his former book, again, that gospel, he wrote about all that Jesus began to do. Luke is pointing out that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were not the end of his work, but just the beginning. Now, by his Holy Spirit, Jesus is continuing the work that he started among us, and he is uh, continuing it throughout the world. The book of Acts shows us that Jesus, or what exactly Jesus started, namely the Christian church. And the book, therefore, gives us some really valuable insights into what it means for you and I to continue following Jesus in our day. Uh, for uh, these and other reasons, this Easter season, we are going to look at the book of Acts in order to learn how uh, we can continue what Jesus started. Today, we're going to start by looking at the sermon uh, that the Apostle Peter preached on Pentecost. We'll consider... Uh, just the first half of his sermon this week, and then we'll look at the second half of it uh, next week. For now, we will read from Acts chapter 2. I'll read verses, uh, or the first part of verse uh, 14, and then uh, verses 12, 22 through 32. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. This is God's word. You may have uh, noticed that Peter begins his sermon with a lot of proofs of who Jesus is and what Jesus taught. The early Christian church was clearly established on real historical events that, that had pro uh, proceeded then to change the course of human history. And so to that end, today, as we begin looking at the book of Acts, we will uh, start by looking at a number of proofs for the Christian faith, and then we will go on to discuss the struggles that come with proofs, um, the, the reason that proofs for uh, uh, what we believe often fail, uh, and then we're going to talk about our need as believers to commit our lives uh, to allowing the truth to change our lives uh, rather than the other way around. Um, so to begin, in Peter's sermon, uh, he first points to Jesus' miracles, uh, then the greatest of those miracles, obviously being the resurrection, uh, and then he points to Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, and finally, uh, he states that he and the other disciples are eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Now, this gives us a good opportunity to consider a few simple arguments for our faith, and we had better uh, be able to do so, actually. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul establishes uh, that Christianity hinges on whether or not the resurrection happened. If it did not, Paul writes that we are still in our sins and our faith is futile. If the Christian faith is just a bunch of hearsay and uh, uh, random legends, uh, then it is useless to us. So uh, first off, let's consider uh, Peter's last point as far as arguments for the faith. Um, let's consider Peter's last point that he and the other disciples were eyewitnesses. We can consider their testimony uh, in one of four ways. Uh, either the disciples were lying, so they made this all up. Uh, they were lunatics. Uh, they believed it, but they had some mental problem or they hallucinated. Uh, so they uh, 
did not actually this they believed it, but they were actually still telling a lie, uh, or it was all just a, me- a legend that was made up long after the fact, uh, or they are telling the truth. Those are really kind of the four options, right? As far as the disciples' testimony, their eyewitness testimony. Uh, We can discount the liar theory right off the get-go because they really had nothing to gain from their lie. They taught lives of cross-carrying, poverty, and chastity, uh, and then they were violently persecuted and killed for what they taught. So there really was no benefit to them lying. They had every reason uh, to tell the truth if if it was all something they were making up. There was no reason for them to lie. Uh, hallu- uh, hallucination or mental illness uh, doesn't really adequately explain their testimony either. Um, again, because of the persecutions they suffered, they had every reason to question what they witnessed. Did we really see Jesus alive or not? Uh, are we really willing to suffer through all this if we're not totally sure? Uh, their lives could have been much easier and way more enjoyable if they denied their claims, right? Furthermore, uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no evidence that group hallucination is even possible. In addition, the hallucination theory also doesn't explain the fact that Jesus' tomb was found empty. Uh, There's no no, uh, way that hallucination would fit into that at all. The legend theory doesn't really work uh, with the evidence because, as the book of Acts indicates, the disciples did not wait for decades so that stories about Jesus could become legendary. Instead, they began their eyewitness testimony almost immediately when anyone could go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, and verify the things that they were saying. The book of uh, the books of the New Testament also were written much closer to the events uh, they were uh, that they discuss than do most of our uh, records of ancient history. By uh, ancient world historical standards, Jesus' resurrection is one of the most verifiable events, uh, and so this leaves us with one final option for the disciples' testimony, that they were telling the truth. Um, So there's the the possibility of what what that means regarding the disciples' testimony. Uh, We could also go with the minimal facts argument, uh, which takes uh, four events that most scholars, even unbelieving ones, uh, will accept as history. Number one, Jesus was crucified and died. Number two, he was buried. Number three, the uh, tomb was found empty. Number four, uh, the disciples claimed that he was alive even dying for that claim. Uh, Again, the simplest explanation of all those uh, events together is that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. Uh, There's a maximal facts argument, uh, which carefully analyzes the New Testament texts, uh, specifically the Gospels and Acts, and finds the myriad of examples of how they show themselves to be accurate historical documents for that time, for that place, for that culture in history, uh, and also how they verify and agree with each other in often small and subtle ways that really would not make sense if if they were simply making things up or if these were simply uh, oral legends that were passed down. Uh, The argument uh, also concludes that if these writings show themselves to be so accurate and honest in all of these little ways, uh, what reason do we have to turn around and then accuse the Gospels of being wrong when it comes to the biggest claim that they make, that Jesus rose from the dead? Uh, There's also the argument from other messiahs. Uh, There were many people in the ancient uh, world who claimed to be the messiah of the Old Testament scriptures, but all of their movements faded away pretty much immediately when the person uh, claiming to be the Messiah died. So how is it then that when Jesus appears, makes this claim to be a Messiah, and he ends up dying in one of the most humiliating and public ways of crucifixion, how is it then that after his death, his movement suddenly takes on a far bigger uh, energy than it ever had during Jesus' ministry? Uh, Why should this Messiah with one of the most embarrassing ends be the one to catch on? What is the best explanation for this Jesus movement and the explosion of the early Christian church except for the body, bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead? Now, there are more arguments for Jesus' resurrection, um, and we could even closely examine Peter's proofs that he points to in, in uh, his Pentecost sermon. But for now, we really need to move on to our next point because you'll notice right away in the book of Acts at Pentecost when the early Christian church is just about to start, Peter, in this foundational sermon, basically spends the first half of his uh, sermon pointing to the evidence of what he's saying. Peter is setting up the early Christian church with a commitment to truth. 
As 3,000 people were about to be added to the church uh, on Pentecost, Peter was making it clear that Jesus, this uh, movement that Jesus started, is going to be built on truth. Now, we might ask why that is necessary. I mean, doesn't everybody just believe whatever they uh, seem, to, whatever seems to be true in front of them? Uh, and if you have to ask that, I would, I would encourage you to rethink about that question and rethink about your life and people around you. <laughs> I often hear, for example, uh, in various arguments, whether it's about uh, politics or nutrition or uh, religion or, or whatever other thing, uh, you'll often hear people throw this accusation out that the other side just won't accept the facts. Uh, have you ever uh, shown someone clear evidence of the truth only to have them refuse to believe it? I've seen this myself uh, multiple times as I've worked as a pastor showing people their sins uh, and they don't want to accept uh, that what they did was wrong. I've caught people in lies and uh, they will uh, refuse uh, to uh, acknowledge that, that they're lying, right? They'll say, no, it's everybody else who's lying. Um, furthermore, I just know this in my own life. Uh, I find times where uh, I and faced with a harsh truth, and I don't want to believe it. You see, truth is not a natural value for humanity. In psychology, they call it confirmation bias. Uh, in, uh, for our, for uh, us as Christians, we can just call it pride. But in our sinfulness, we love the idea of being right more than we love the truth. It takes less mental energy to just go on believing what I've always believed uh, rather than to follow the evidence. Like Pontius Pilate who asked Jesus what is truth and then just walked away, many in our culture today uh, have given up on the entire idea of truth. They will say that it is much more important to speak about my truth. Others uh, will say that the truth is too divisive, uh, that we should just agree to disagree so that we can all get along and ignore that pesky truth. You see, this is the weakness of good arguments. I could go on all day giving evidences and proofs for things, but good evidence inevitably fails when we don't care about truth. When all we care about is puffing up our pride, there is no point in following the evidence because we're not going to care. If I am more committed to chasing after convenient lies rather than hard truths, then all the evidences in the world don't mean anything. But the Christian church as it was beginning on Pentecost, made it clear right from the outset uh, that they would relentlessly commit to truth. And Jesus had taught them this uh, throughout his ministry. Uh, you can find plenty of places in the gospel uh, when Jesus embarrassed his disciples by showing them the truth. Uh, furthermore, uh, as we've already said, the early Christian church had plenty of reason to cling to convenient lies, uh, especially as they were going to be facing persecution. But, again, right at the outset, Relentless truth was a core value of this movement that Jesus started. And so especially today, in our day, uh, with all of our misinformation and propaganda, with our mainstream media news that is constantly caught in lies, with uh, an internet that uh, makes it really quite true that a lie can travel all the way around the world before the truth has time to get its boots on, uh, with our endless entertainment, which makes it easier than ever to just distract ourselves and ignore those hard truths, we today, we Christians, need to carry on this tradition of relentless truth. We cannot believe everything that we hear. We need to be careful of our tendency toward convenient lies. Uh, we need to hold to the truth, even when uh, it is embarrassing, even when it hurts, even when it makes everyone hate us. Uh, and that is what we see from the early Christian church in the book of Acts. And so that is what the Christian church needs to continue to be until Christ comes again. But there's one last aspect of being uh, committed to the truth that we really need to consider today as well. Um, this maybe wasn't an issue for uh, the people back in Peter's day, um, but C.S. Lewis pointed this out. Uh, he described how there was a time in the past when men, if their beliefs were changed about something, they would have changed their lives to reflect the new thing they now believed. Um, and then Lewis laments that this is not who we are today. <laughs> Uh, perhaps it's because of our many distractions. Perhaps it's because we are less logical than people in the past. But for whatever the reasons, we today may change our minds about what we believe, but very often it will not be accompanied by an actual change in our lives, lives that actually match our new beliefs. Case in point, the surveys I've seen uh, regarding morality 
Uh, when you compare those who call themselves Christians with other people groups, uh, you generally see no significant different in, difference in how people live. There's generally the same portion of uh, people committing sins of gossip, seeking revenge, various sexual sins, lies, and the list goes on. If we truly believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then that needs to have an, an, an effect on our lives. Again, we look back to the book of Acts and we see that the resurrection of Jesus had a huge impact on the people who first joined the early Christian church. It had a profound impact on their lives as they committed themselves to the truth along with their fellow believers. We, if we are going to follow Christ like they did, we need to commit ourselves. We need to examine our lives. We need to face those hard truths about how we measure up to what we believe. We need to repent and change so that our lives will be in line with the truth. I encourage you this Easter season to commit yourself to the truth. Spend more time in the truth of God's word. Talk with a trusted fellow Christian about uh, how you can bring your life more closely in line with the truth of Christ. And as we together walk the path of repentance and committing to the truth, no matter how difficult, let us remember the foundational truth of Christianity. That Jesus died for our sins, but as Peter uh, preached, it was impossible for death to keep it, its hold on him. Jesus has been raised to life again bringing us full forgiveness for all our lies, for all our commitments to lies in the, in the face of proof to the contrary, and for all uh, our living inconsistently with what we know to be true. The resurrection means that we, too, now have a new life, a new life committed to the truth. Amen. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy. But be still and know that I am God. Be still and know.